Hello and welcome to the Odd Years Podcast. I'm Amy Walter. It's an odd-numbered year, which means that national elections are on hiatus, but the issues, trends, and personalities that impact electoral politics are always in cycle. This week, we look at the battle for the Republican nomination that's turning out to be, well, not that much of a fight. Not that long ago, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis was riding a wave of post-election momentum and buzz. Today, he's trailing Donald Trump in national polls by almost 40 points. At this point, even as the indictments against the former president pile up, it's hard to see how Trump loses the nomination. I've invited Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark and host of the Focus Group podcast, to help us understand how we got here. Now, there are a few people in politics who spend as much time with Republican voters as Sarah. She and her team conduct focus groups with Republican voters across the country and across the ideological spectrum. Sarah isn't a dispassionate observer, She was one of the founders of the Republican Accountability Project, an organization of other never-Trump Republicans dedicated to defeating the former Republican president. But she's a serious strategist who wants to understand what makes Republican voters tick and how they are processing this moment. She doesn't hold these focus groups to try and convince or influence the participants. She's there to listen and learn. And today, she shares the insights she's gleaned with us. Without further ado, here's Sarah Longmore. Sarah Longwell. Hey, how you doing? I am good. This is fun that now I get to be the one interviewing you. I know. I'm so excited. I've been looking forward to for weeks. I want to start you with the focus groups of which you conduct many, many, especially among Republican voters, Republican primary voters. So help us understand what these voters are telling you now about Donald Trump, about the Republican primary, and how different it is now than it was, say, at the end or close to the end of 2022? What changed? Well, the biggest thing that changed is that at the end of 2022, there was the big Ron DeSantis boomlet in the focus groups. We would have whole groups all the time who wanted Ron DeSantis to be the nominee. In fact, it was so complete and total, the interest in Ron DeSantis, that we actually started screening for sort of high favorability of Trump to find the Trump voters. And that's completely reversed. And what do, what do you mean by completely reversed? Well, the majority of the groups now, they want Trump to be the nominee. I think that there's a bunch of things going on. So when people talked about DeSantis in the beginning, They were talking a pretty similar way, but the way that they described DeSantis was Trump without the baggage. Mm -hmm. And the big opportunity for DeSantis, the thing they liked about him so much is that they thought he could win over swing voters, that he was electable. And at the time, electability, I mean, you know, Republican voters, when they talk about Biden, they talk about the Democrats, the level of sort of catastrophe that they believe the country is currently experiencing is extremely high. I mean, people talk about us being in an economic situation that's worse than the Great Depression and a lot of economic concerns, a lot of concerns about Biden and his sort of mental fitness. And so beating Biden, there's this there's this idea too with Biden and his mental acuity, there's also this idea that the that there are people behind the scenes that are really running things. So there's this nameless, faceless cabal that are running things that people feel very threatened by. And so beating Biden is extremely important to them. And that's where they saw Ron DeSantis. People had so many funny things where they would say, you know, DeSantis, he was Trump without the baggage, but he's also, he was Trump with a mute button. He was Trump not on steroids. Not on steroids was one of my favorite ones. And they just, over time, two things happened where I saw the switch. So there was the first indictment, but the first indictment corresponded with DeSantis's first real public missteps. This was when the Stormy Daniels was the first indictment. We may be losing track. There's been a bunch of them. But when the first indictment came down, there was this phenomenon that I've seen now with the impeachments and everything else, the rally round Trump effect occurred. I just saw the voters kind of coming to Trump's defense. This is people trying to get him. This is a corrupt DA in New York, that kind of thing. But also DeSantis did his, he talked about Ukraine as a territorial dispute which much aligning himself with sort of Trump's foreign policy. But then he got yelled at by establishment Republicans and he walked it back. And for a guy who has really said, like, I'm a fighter, I'm your guy, the like falling, the kowtowing to the establishment, I think, wore poorly 
for voters, but then attacking Trump. So he did this thing where he thought he was being cute on the Stormy Daniels thing. And he said, you know, I think it's bad, the two-tier justicism, but like, I don't know anything about paying off porn stars. And so he takes this kind of like side shot at Trump and the Trump online apparatus just went after DeSantis for that. And then Trump himself also started attacking DeSantis, right? He also started ramping up what was then sort of nobody's better at this than Trump, but just like smearing people without any fear that he could be going too far. He called him Meatball Ron, Don DeSantis, you know, he's like trying out his nicknames. So three people are rallying around Trump while DeSantis takes his first punches. And that was going to be a defining moment for him. How was he going to take those punches? How was he going to handle things? And the answer was poorly. And so it didn't take much at all for people to just go, eh, Trump's fine. I mean, I really appreciate your point about the he walked it back, because if you're going to be a fighter and what makes Trump so unique is he's never going to back down ever. In fact, I remember after the 2018 midterms, talking to a Republican who wasn't a big Trump backer. But I said, well, would things have been better had Jeb Bush been the president or President Scott Walker? Would you have done better in the midterms if the economy were the same? I mean, what did Donald Trump get you that a Scott Walker wouldn't have? And he said, you know what? Scott Walker or the establishment, they wouldn't have gone to bat for Kavanaugh. They would have dropped him as soon as the press said that they didn't like him. The mainstream media said they didn't like Kavanaugh. He would have dropped Kavanaugh. He never would have gone all in on a lot of the tax policy. He would have been scared off by editorials and their friends in the establishment. So I think that's a very good point. Tell me about this, too. I also thought that Trump's decision not just to do the CNN town hall, but to come out looking basically unchanged from the way he was two years earlier was important. I mean, if DeSantis is going to be the younger, more nimble version of Trump. Trump didn't give him a whole lot of opportunities to prove that. Yeah. I mean, I spend a lot of time making sure that I don't do anything to hand it to Trump because you don't got to hand it to Trump. But the one thing I'll give the guy is that people say Biden's old, but you know, Trump's not that much younger. We just have to be honest. Trump seems younger. Yeah. Like, and in that interview with Caitlin Collins, which the turn had sort of already happened with voters okay. by the time we got there. Okay. But there's no doubt that Trump doing those kinds of things, DeSantis just is another way of comparing them. DeSantis has made the media, he just won't talk to them. He won't talk to mainstream media, right? He's like, and I think he's trying to change that now with his new shakeup or whatever. But his unwillingness to talk to the media is actually, it works against him because people like seeing their guys stick it to the mainstream media. And so when he was there, you know, kind of running a little roughshod over Caitlin Collins and they, you know, that was a mistake. Have I'll defend CNN's having him on, but like the stacked audience of Trump supporters, that gave him all the juice he needed. And I think that a lot of people were mad at CNN. I think there was some misplaced anger because I think really what people were reacting to was, oh God, he looks in perfectly good fighting form. We who are political observers, we see him bleeding out these weird truth social posts that are deranged and misspelled. And you're like, this guy's lost his mind. Then you see him do the CNN town hall. I felt this way that I, oh man, he is going to be even harder to beat than I thought, not just in a primary, but in a general election. I literally got a text from a Democrat saying that exact thing, Sarah, that night saying he's as on message as he's ever been. So if you're DeSantis and you're at least at the end of last year, we're making the case that maybe Trump's lost a little off this fastball and he's been sitting in Mar-a-Lago playing golf for two years and he doesn't really have it. Boy, that CNN experience disabused folks of that notion. So, Sarah, we seem to have a chicken and an egg question here, though, when it comes to Ron DeSantis. How much of the fact that Trump has been as successful as he's been in staying on top and continuing, it looks like, to consolidate Republicans about the fact that Ron DeSantis is the wrong candidate or is not running a particularly strong campaign? Or is it that the message we need somebody who can win, he can't win, or Donald Trump, that is, is the wrong message, right? Is it a messenger problem or is it a message problem? Well, I think it's both. I mean, and let me tell you, so I I early, I was going back through my text messages recently and I was looking at a back and forth I was having with a Republican strategist who was like, you got to run to Trump's right. You got to hit him on the vaccines and he didn't build the wall. And I'm going, no, that is wrong. 
that is stupid. Kind of like, well, I guess we'll see if I had to break the Republican Party up roughly. I would say it's like 30 percent always Trump, 30 percent maybe Trump and 30 percent move on from Trump. So Mm -hmm. DeSantis had a choice about how he played this. And in my opinion, he should have tried to consolidate the move on from Trump folks who were way represented in our focus groups. A lot of people, they didn't dislike Trump. They liked him fine. They just thought we needed to move on from Trump. He should have consolidated them and used the consolidation of that group to build out into the maybe Trumpers. Because the maybe Trumpers, they're exactly like they said, they're on the fence. And instead, he decided to wrestle Trump for his death cult. The 30% that are never going anywhere around DeSantis is like, I'm going for those people. And I will never understand this strategy. I would fire all his consultants because this strategy was insane. And then you've got the problem of just sort of DeSantis himself, where I also think that he's had the unfortunate experience of people being more exposed to him and deciding, actually, I don't like him as much. They'd seen him on Fox News and he was supporting Trump and he was the guy in Florida and he was fighting the wokesters. And then like, I mean, I talk to reporters all the time who are asking me things and I'm like, well, you're out there in Iowa. What's it like out there? He's given these 70 minute speeches and he's pretty boring and he's got no charisma and he doesn't want to shake hands with anybody, doesn't want to talk to anybody. And I had talked to some people who had known him from his governor's days and they would tell stories about how, you know, he would just stand in the corner and not talk to anybody. And they were always shorting DeSantis in terms of his capabilities in the presidential because they were like, he's such a weirdo. And I think people have seen more of that. And so I think up in your focus group, sir, is this an inside the beltway conversation or true voters? They're not necessarily souring on DeSantis. It's just like you said, Well, Trump, he's fine. I think he can do this. And also he's getting picked on because they don't want him to come back. It's the deep state and the media hate him and liberals hate him. So let's go get behind him. Yeah, you're right that I don't hear voters saying all the time, like, I think he's weird. They just like have stopped liking him as much, right? Mm -hmm. They just, so it's not that they have to articulate putting fingers. So it's not that, you know what they say about him? They're like, I like Ron DeSantis, but I don't think it's his time yet. Yeah, Like he's young. He has time. He'd be great as Trump's VP. My belief is that there is one path and one path only to defeating Trump, which is a little similar to the Democrats. I'm going to argue a, a position and then I'm going to argue against that position. I'm going to do both. You can do whatever you want. There's one path and it is you make an electability argument. You get either close or you win in Iowa because the one thing that psychologically Republican voters have in their heads is that Trump, ooh, he might not be electable. It is an anxiety that sits there, even from people who want him to be the nominee. Problem for DeSantis is that he had that electability thing eight months ago. They thought, God, DeSantis is electable because he's Trump without the baggage. Then he did six week abortion and then he walked a bunch of stuff back and then he looked like kind of a weakling. And now they're just like, I'm not sure that he's more electable than Donald Trump. But I think there's still a chunk of people who believe that. Like the one argument that works with voters, the only one is that Trump might not be able to win an election because he alienates so many independents and swing voters. And I think that if DeSantis had really, he says it, but he's never done it headlong. He could have gold watched Trump to death, just being like, Trump was a great president. Because by the way, all these voters, they think Trump was a great Great. president. They say it all the time. He did a great job. He was a great president. Santos should have acknowledged that and been like, and we need somebody who can really take the ball forward. We need someone who can win the election, but can continue to make America great again. If he wanted to run like Trump, he could have run that way, but he didn't. He did like, I'm not really going to take Trump on directly, but I am going to sign a six-week abortion ban, which by the way, is not actually that popular with a broad swath of the Republican voters. Of That's Republican right. voters. That's right. You underestimate this about Trump, about how much him being perceived as a social moderate actually helped him. You know, it's and this is like DeSantis hitting him over the gay stuff. Like it's a total misread. These non-college secular working class voters, many of whom were Obama Trump voters, they like didn't care that Trump was married three times. They think that Mike Pence is a weirdo, too conservative, too snooty and judgmental about with his evangelical religious stuff. They might even call themselves evangelicals, but they're not that kind of evangelical. And so they were fine with Trump's social moderation. That was a boon for him. The fact that he's not hardcore on abortion works. It also works with Republican voters, not just swing voters. Right. We'll be right back with more from the odd years. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the odd years podcast. We hope you're enjoying these interviews and we need your help. One of the best ways to support our podcast is by leaving a review on your favorite platform. Just a few words about what you like about the show. 
Your review not only helps us know what we're doing right, but it also helps other people find the odd years. Speaking of helping other listeners find the odd years, please share your favorite episode with someone you think might enjoy these conversations. On behalf of our team, thank you for your support. That kind of brings us, I want to stick with this electability thing because yeah, yeah, yeah. you are also involved with the Republican Accountability Project and you all are up with ads that address just that, right? Yeah. These are two-time Trump voters saying exactly what you said. I think he was doing a good job, but I just don't know that he can win the election. We've got another group, Win It Back, which is somehow affiliated or associated with the Club for Growth saying that they also, with ads that are similar, I don't know if you've seen the Win It Back yeah. ads, mm-hmm. making electability, same thing. Yep. Like Donald Trump, but it's just like too much. We need to move on, turn the page. Let's get somebody who can beat Joe Biden. So you're making this argument and yet the big vacuum there is, okay, so who's that person? Yeah, totally. So, so who is it? Yeah. What do you no, think right? it is, Sarah? Is there anyone that now you say, all right, if it's not DeSantis, who can fill that? electability and appeal lane? Yeah, this is a really good question. And this is where I was saying, like, I was kind of going to argue with myself because oh. I, I think strategically, I believe that Donald Trump is an existential threat to democracy. And I'm in the anybody but Trump camp in terms of who I would like to see win the Republican primary. And I'm not going to sit on the sidelines and not take the one path that I see as having some opportunity. Because the one thing I see in all the focus group is this anxiety about Trump's ability to win. I think that we are still far enough out that more things can happen, more exogenous events, and that you need to be putting in people's minds that Trump is a bad bet for the general election. And you need to do it in a way that's persuasive, not from the never Trumpers like me, but from these two time Trump voters who talk just like the people do in the focus groups. Trump did a lot of great things. I really like him, but here's why he can't win. Here's why it's a mistake to nominate him. We need somebody else. But I'll tell you, if you ask these voters who that other person should be, they sound like me, where some people are like, well, probably DeSantis, right? He gets the most from people. But there's a Tim Scott faction. And then there's a really emergent but exuberant Vivek Ramaswamy faction. I was just in Iowa doing focus groups for PBS. I was did like a non-college group and a college group. And the non-college group was all, all for Trump, just unanimous, swept the board. But in the college educated group, there were some people, their heads were saying DeSantis, but their hearts were saying Vivek Ramaswamy. Oh, right. Like they liked him. I was like pronouncing his name wrong. And they were like, no, it's Vivek, not Vivek, because he's up there and they see him and they like him. And you know what he has? He has this thing that Republican voters just love, which is he is not a politician. That is what I wanted. To, I'm so glad you brought that up, Sarah, because my theory has long been the only candidate who could, maybe that's not fair to say the only candidate, but the candidate most likely to beat Donald Trump in a Republican primary would be somebody who is like Donald Trump, a business person, an outsider, a celebrity. I kind of went to, and I know, I I don't think he even identifies as Republican, but somebody like Mark Cuban. Yeah. Somebody like Elon Musk, right? There's a reason that Tucker Carlson gets raised all the time. I just don't think that, a traditional Republican politician, which all of these folks except Vivek Ramaswamy are, can find that appeal that a Donald Trump can. If this were an open field and it was a bunch of these traditional Republicans with their traditional backgrounds running against each other, we'd be having a different conversation. Yep. Is that kind of where we are in that? As long as there are establishment politicians as the only alternatives, there's not going to be somebody who can break through. Yeah. You know, I wrote this whole piece about the before Trump and after Trump in the before times. Right. <laughs> Tim Scott is a, an attractive candidate. Nikki Haley is an attractive candidate. But the voters are super clear. They say it flat out. We're not going back. Yeah. And what they mean is like, we are not going back to that old version of the Republican Party and they are not that interested. This is why it's so hard to answer your question, because there is a dearth, a total dearth of political talent in this field that understands how to do what needs to be done right now. And I'll tell you what, they would all benefit from listening to doing the focus groups because they clearly do not know their own voters. Mike Pence has a death wish or like a humiliation fetish. I don't know what is going on there, but this team must be doing focus groups. He must be hearing the same thing I am. This guy has a hundred percent name ID and it's not voters aren't that interested in him. It's that they hate him or they think he's so boring. There's just no interest in Mike Pence. Now, here's the thing. 
Tim Scott is going to get a look. He's going to have a moment. He's going to get a look. And And spending more than almost anybody else, certainly in Iowa, but I think he'll be doing so in New Hampshire and South Carolina as well. Yeah. So my theory of what's going to happen, this is my theory. Mm -hmm. I think I think we have to try to knock Trump down and use these two time Trump voters against him in the primary. Even if it looks like we might not be able to win, it could drain some people from him from the general election. It could help other people pop. This is what I was trying to argue before. The only way to do this is that someone else pops in Iowa and there's a consolidation and a pragmatism emerges, just like it did with Biden, where people are like, you know what, we got to go with this person who can win. And suddenly there's a there's a huge shift right at the end. I'm a little skeptical of that myself because Republicans are super different than Democrats. And also, if a bunch of establishment people jump behind whoever the nominee is, that actually doesn't help them. It kind of works against them. So I know all those things intellectually. Yes. Yes. Still believe in fighting this fight. I still think that Tim Scott could have a moment here and pop. I don't know that I've seen him demonstrate, like I said, the necessary political talent to grab that moment and make it what it is. What I think happens, I think that Trump either loses Iowa or wins narrowly, but then he bounces into New Hampshire does great. And then he cuts a deal with Tim Scott going into South Carolina for VP. And that's your ticket. Um, Mm -hmm. Because Tim Scott strikes me as somebody who's running for VP in the campaign that he's running the way he's talked about Trump in the past. He's doing nothing to try to angle against Trump, nothing to make Trump mad at him. He's got his 10 percent in South Carolina, which Trump could add to him, become a dominant force and just he'll cruise through Nevada and then he'll bounce into Super Tuesday with all that momentum. And If you look at polling in those early Super Tuesday states that are like winner take all, winner take most, like Trump is crushing in those states too, not just the early states. And so anyway, but we got to do what we can to see if you can force a momentum shift by beating Trump in an early state. I think that's the only way. But as you point out, the only other thing is like, you know, Glenn Youngkin, he's such a person we in D.C. would like. Oh, my gosh. But he's still sitting out there on the sidelines. He has super low name ID. But like there's going to be a moment where somebody is the number two person against Trump, whether that's DeSantis or whatever. Mitt Romney had a piece the other day calling for everybody else to drop out. As the guys pointed out on the Next Level podcast, there was a Monmouth poll that showed, though, even if it was head to head with just DeSantis, Trump was still up 20 points. Yeah. But like that's. That's right. This is not 2016 where people are splitting the vote, the anti-Trump vote four or five ways. There's the Trump vote, which I don't know, you can put anywhere from 40 to 45 percent. And then there's a little run DeSantis and then there are people in the single digits. Yeah. Now, this is just one of those moments where my my analysis bumps up against my desire to do something, my need to do something. And so I look for like, what's the one narrow option? And like, we're pushing into that, which is to make an electability pitch and to try to win an Iowa and to hope somebody pops. What I want for DeSantis is for him to just like fully crater so that someone else has a chance. But even I am aware that we're talking about a super outside chance here. We just are. And so, Sarah, the more that these indictments pile up, doesn't it make it harder for any other candidate to break through? Yeah. And I mean, I argued this back when it was happening. I was like, the problem is, you know, there's a lot of like Beltway chatter, the cable news chatter, where it's like there'll be more indictments and the cumulative effect of the indictments will weigh Trump down. I think there's like a 6% chance that that's true. I think there's a 94% chance that it becomes white noise for voters. It allows Trump to be the center of the conversation. It forces the other competitors to continue to defend Trump, attack the deep state, attack the DOJ. They all become bit players in a central drama around Donald Trump. It becomes impossible for them to make an affirmative case for themselves. And like, that's what we've seen happening. That's all we've seen. And I don't see any reason that that dynamic would get disrupted. I think that the cumulative effect is just they're like, I don't know what indictment are you even talking about? Like, there's so many of them who can tell them apart. Because sometimes people say things to me like, well, what about this Georgia one? Do you think that'll be different? And I'm like, none of them are different to people. They're not they're not tracking like the nuances. I appreciate the the argument, the Brad thing coming first was problematic because it was looked like such an overreach that this is about payoffs to a mistress versus, you know, had the Mar-a-Lago documents case come first, maybe it'd be more serious. But to your point, I, I agree. Like it is not about the individual cases. It is they are taking things that for any other politician would have been a misdemeanor or would have been a deal they would have cut or maybe they wouldn't have gone after this person. 
and they use every opportunity they can to go after Donald Trump. And it's not going to change when the Fulton County, Georgia case comes through. Well, boy, I don't know. That was about overturning the vote in Georgia. That's very different. Now I've changed my mind about whether I'll support Donald Trump. The going to the right issue, I think, is really important to a point that you brought up too, and that I've talked to probably some of the same people you have in the DeSantis orbit about the decision to go there. Seems to me they were doing two things. I'm, I'm curious your take. One was recognizing or assuming that because they had establishment donors, that those donors would stick around because they got the joke, right? Yeah. And they'd understand He's just doing this to win Trump voters. But what it ended up doing is saying to establishment donors, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this. I signed up to get a normie Republican like we used to have, or at least somebody who's like Trump. Some of the stuff I like about Trump, but can actually win. But you kind of went over the top here with Disney and the woke attacks and the six week abortion ban. And the other is their argument being that you have to win over conservatives, Republicans, and those are the voters that even Donald Trump acknowledges are motivated by things like trans issues more than taxes or the economy. Curious to get your take on both of those things. Obviously, it wasn't a slam dunk how DeSantis could run this campaign, right? Because the base wants a lot of red meat. And I actually think that DeSantis is doing a little more policy in these speeches, actually, than people realize, and that it's actually working against him. In Iowa, like I think there's a decent chunk of policy. That's why they're 70 minutes long. And I think voters are kind of like, I'm bored. You know, give me something more fun. Look, I think DeSantis ultimately had to be he had to be a different person. Donald Trump, again, don't want to give him any credit here, but like he is charismatic. He does understand people. He knows how to connect with them. He knows how to put on a show. I mean, the number of voters that I listen to in the focus groups who kind of say like, well, I wasn't really interested in politics until Donald Trump came along. And like then it was fun and interesting. Or like, I never cared about politics till Trump, and now I care. What they mean is it's not boring anymore. No one's trying to talk to me about like boring policy stuff. Like he was putting on a show and I liked it. And I think DeSantis just doesn't know how to do that. And the other thing, there's just a lot of misreads about what made Trump successful. The DeSantis seemed like they got the hate right. DeSantis is going to attack these people. Like, And you got to like ship migrants to Martha's Vineyard. You got to you got to do these stunts. You got to make sure people know what a son of a bitch you are. The Santa though does not know how to have joy in his stuff. The thing about Trump, there's a red solo cup effect, right? People want to go to his rallies and drink beer and it's like a show and they find Trump fun and funny. And Trump, I find him repellent, but those voters find him funny and charismatic in a way that DeSantis just doesn't bring to the table. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why the electability thing is falling sort of short is that I think there's a chunk of voters that move on from Trumpers who care about electability. And then there's a bunch of people who are like, this is more fun than politics ever was. I want to go back to when this was fun. I want to give this guy another shot. I want him to show them up. That's the other problem with the electability argument, by the way, is that like there's a 70 percent of the Republican Party who does not think Trump lost the last election. And so to be like, we need someone who can win. They're like, Trump won. Right. And even if you don't like the poll, don't trust the polls, don't trust what happened in the last election, the polling shows that the race is really close between Biden and Trump. So it's hard to make the argument, even to donors, that, well, Trump can't win. The Odd Years is brought to you by the Cook Political Report team. It's our way of sharing the questions we love to ask and the conversations we enjoy having behind the scenes. If you'd like to explore more of what we have to offer, consider subscribing at cookpolitical.com slash subscribe. Odd Years listeners can use the discount code ODD10, the number 10 that is, to save 10% on any subscription. This offer is available only to new subscribers. I want to switch gears for a minute, though, to another group of voters you spent a lot of time talking with, and those are the Trump to Biden voters. And I don't know if you've done as much work with them this year, but we know that Democrats are clearly very upset, obsessed, terrified, maybe even about the prospect of a third party candidate coming from this no labels unity ticket and that that candidate, because they would be more of a centrist, be a Republican on the ticket, this unity ticket would pull back those Trump to Biden voters away from Biden into a third party. And I'm curious your take on that. If those voters 
one, would ever think about something like that. And two, if they'd ever go back to Trump, if they now in 2020 were saying, well, I wanted to get rid of the chaos and it was too dangerous and I went with Biden. If they're now saying, yeah, I went with Biden in 2020, but I didn't think he was going to run for re-election. I'm not up for having an 86-year-old president. Yeah, so... You are correct in that going into 2022, I was basically only talking to swing voters. Then we switched gears and we've mostly right. been focused on two-time Trump voters, but we do throw in a swing voter group every couple of weeks or every few weeks. I've been telling all my Democratic friends who think Trump's the best person to run against, you guys, there's a ton of backsliding from these Trump to Biden voters. And they say things like there was a guy in a recent one, and this stuck with me. He said, I'm going to close my eyes, turn off the TV and just enjoy Trump's economy. I'm going to ignore the chaos. I'm going to enjoy Trump's economy. The swing voters are very economically sensitive. They talk a lot about the economy. And I think that right now, even though the macro, I wrote a piece about this recently for the Bulwark, the macroeconomic environment has been improving. Looks like the Fed just said we're going to avoid a recession. And the problem is, is that the voters, especially the Trump voters, I think there's two things going on. One is they just don't feel it in their lives. So they still, the inflation still shows the rents are going up, food is still more expensive, expensive. gas is still expensive. A lot of it much more expensive than it was sort of pre-pandemic and then during the pandemic. So people got used to lower costs of things because like we weren't doing as much and everything. And so now everything seems really, really high to people. And so that's part of it. The other thing is like people see the economy like they do everything else through a partisan lens. They're not going to give it to Biden and be like, Biden's really turned down around the macro economy. And I'm excited for the (laughs) supply chain to have kicked back in and for everything to get better in six months. Like until they feel real gains, they are going to catastrophize about Biden's economy. And because this administration, one of its just key weaknesses is that they don't know how to not message around good news, but amplify around good news. Like Trump was so good at being like, best economy for black people, best economy for women. How's your 401k doing, buddy? And he'd like run around doing that. And then Jim Jordan, like an auctioneer, would be like, we moved this thing to Israel and we did this and this is the economy. And that isn't it great. All the Republicans would do it. They have no surrogate game on the Democrats. And so as a result, some of it is psychological. Like tell people the economy is bad. They'll believe it's bad. Sort of not irrespective of what's going on in their own life. It shades it. And I think that rather than really amping up the good news here. And Democrats are so much less likely to do that, right? They just, they're like, well, if people aren't feeling it, we don't want to tell people (laughs) something that's not their lived experience. And I'm like, sure, but also like, you got to get in the messaging game here, guys. And so I think that's part of the reason there's a lot of backsliding. Biden's age is also a big problem. And then you bring up the no labels thing. The no labels thing, I think, is a real threat. I have been somebody who like my heart has chased the third party thing a little bit back when I because I was a Republican and I didn't want to vote for I've been on the same journey that I take a lot of these voters on now. But I just had to get comfortable voting for Democrats because I ran the third party stuff down. You reelect Trump every time. Well, there are just more soft, soft Biden voters who are voting more against Trump than for Biden. And they're kind of these like double doubters. There's this guy, Doug Sosnick, and it's coined them the double doubters. And when I saw that, I was like, that's exactly it. I wish I had come up with that. Because that's what I hear in the focus groups is people who don't like Trump. They also don't like Biden. And Biden's got to win those people. And in 2022, Mark Kelly won those people. Yeah. And, you know, a bunch of other, you know, Warnock won those people and Whitmer won those people. And so I think that Biden can again win those people. But... His age is a problem, and it is also a problem that people don't like to talk about it. The voters on Kamala Harris, they are just out. And there's a reason that Nikki Haley and some of these Republicans say, I don't want a Kamala Harris presidency. And they're running against Joe Biden's out of the picture. And so I'm very concerned. I see with the swing voters some backsliding. I do think that bounces back. I'll just say this is I'm anticipating once Trump's more in the picture, once he's the actual nominee. I bet we see a little less of that, but I think it's going to be closer than people think. I do not think it is a slam dunk against Trump. A re-elect would be a slam dunk, you mean? Yeah, that's right. Oh, and sorry, but no labels should stop it, but they should just stop it. People are really spun up about no labels and I understand why, but part of me wants to laugh because I'm like, they don't have a nominee. They don't have a ticket. And when they do, you're going to be like, The Joe Manchin, Larry Hogan ticket, they are winning 95% of billionaires and 8% of the population. Like, it's it's just, right? Yeah, no, it's Uh, it's appeal lessons once you put an actual name to it. These polls that come out that show 47% or whatever the number was would support an independent candidate. Sure, 
You know what? My fantasy candidate. I, yeah. I, who can I have in there? Anyone I want? Anyone who? Great. Yeah. Put them in. Then you go, oh, it's a guy named Joe Manchin from West Virginia. Oh, all right. Yeah. It does seem like one of these things too. a Democratic star just to, said to me, this is the kind of conversation that way too online people or way too plugged in people are having about politics. It's it's the equivalent of buying the expansion pack in a board game. You know, you've played a board game so many times and you're kind of bored with it. So you need yeah. something else to keep you occupied because we know a Trump versus Biden, what this is going to look like, how close it's going to be. We know what the issues are going to be, right? I mean, as you point out, other things are going to happen, but we have pretty good sense of what this is going to ultimately look like with a rematch. Can I ask you a question about that? Because this is the thing, right? I do think that just for poor Beltway reporters and poor political reporters and horse race talkers and the cable stations, like this is going to be a brutal stretch if this stays like this, right? You got like Biden is just presidenting and low key and old and not doing much against OK, Trump was exciting the first time, but like this primary is not that exciting. And also it's a rematch. Like, But my question for you is you've watched a lot of elections closely. And my sense is that as much as I want there to be a shift because of an exogenous event, when somebody's up by 30 points, how often do exactly. you see that flip? Yeah. You mean that the candidate like Trump loses a primary? That you have a steady I agree. 30 point we lead don't. for a long time. And then like things just implode. Like exactly. how often have you seen that? Exactly. Never. And and I was trying to go back to, you know, people say, well, remember John McCain came back McCain, and yeah. John Kerry. Well, they came back. They were front runners who slid. And you, you could argue, and that was the case that, you know, really their campaigns were ill-suited. They hadn't really found their groove, but they started the race as a front runner. They fell back. They came back. Versus starting the race as someone who was well positioned or well discussed, Tim Pawlenty, and who else falls into that category? Scott Walker. Scott Walker. Although at least in points he was leading in. Yeah, true. Right. Maybe Jeb a little bit. Maybe Jeb a little bit. He too was leading. Like I've never seen anybody. The only other person that we can make that case for is the Hillary Clinton Barack Obama in two thousand. Mm. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I was looking up at Des Moines Register poll. I mean, man, even by November, by the late fall, maybe it wasn't November, but September, late fall-ish, Hillary was up a lot in Iowa. It looked like, all right, this is a done deal. Good for you, Barack Obama, but, you know, good luck next time. You're a young guy. You can get another bite at the apple. The difference, I think, between, say, an Obama coming and, and having a surprise and, you know, overtaking the obvious front runner and like a Ron DeSantis is one, Hillary Clinton is not the incumbent in the way that Donald Trump is. I mean, he's essentially an incumbent yep. with a 75 percent approval rating. I keep saying to people, if, if I said to you as a consultant, Sarah, like, hey, listen, I'm a candidate. I want to challenge this person in the primary, this incumbent who has 100 percent name ID and like 75, 80 percent approval rating. Do you think I would win? And you'd be like, no, no. Yeah. Right. So how do you do that? The only way you do that is as Obama did, which is create basically an alternative movement. He understood what his appeal was. The other thing that was different was we're living just in such a different time now. I mean, I even think about, yeah, this was pre-Twitter and pre all of this stuff. You could afford maybe to, you know, he certainly had the stories written about him about is Obama really going to make it? Is, is Hillary running away with it? But it wasn't quite as insistent as it is now and constantly in the in the background. But I just think there was something about Obama that you could see there as here's his skill set. Maybe it's too soon. Maybe she's too tough to knock off, but you kind of knew what his appeal was going to be. And he ended up being the right person at the right time, which is he understood that the electorate was looking for something new and different. They were primed for somebody different. And even though she checked the box being a woman, he many more boxes checked. And then, of course, the Iraq war being really the fundamental, like you knew what the fundamental issue was to go after Hillary Clinton. And there we go. But I guess that would be the only in recent era, the example of somebody who and by collapse, 
I mean, she didn't collapse, but she went from being an obvious, almost certain to win to it came all the way down to the very end. And yeah. she lost, obviously. Out yeah. Of, and I mean, I guess, do we think Ron DeSantis is Barack Obama? That's right. Does he have some? That's what I mean. Is there yeah. something that you, you've seen that makes you think he really understands where the Republican electorate is? That is the argument that his team makes. And I'm sure you've heard the same, Sarah, is that Yes, because he is going after the book and the social issues in a way that Donald Trump does it. He fully appreciates where these voters have shifted over the last four years in a way that Donald Trump doesn't. I don't know that I I buy that. And no, it's like it's not it doesn't seem to be where they are getting. You can get energy from that, but it's not. a. Yeah, no, you can get some energy for it. Like the yes. trans stuff. Listen, the trans stuff comes up early in the focus groups a lot of times. There was a woman, she said recently, well, because these men doing woman face. And my moderator was like, what's woman face? And she was like, these men that dress like blackface, like women who dress up like women. I called it woman face. So like, that's not a term I've ever heard before, but it is deeply offensive to her. And she brought it up organically. And so you hear that it's not like they haven't found some good groups to hate. They have found some good groups to hate. And they're leaning into that. The problem is, is A, they go too far where like it can't be the only thing you talk about. Sort of it can't be the only thing you stand for because people want more than that. And then the Republican Party and the donors, they've all kind of moved on on the gay stuff. DeSantis sort of goes into that. It's like he's very online launching on Twitter. This guy that he just fired, Nate Hockman, was like literally there was a Nazi insignia in what he was like. That is not where the energy is. Yeah. It's I'm not saying you can't get away with that with some I mean DeSantis never should have hired that guy. The team never should have let him be there. This guy was like a Nick Fuentes flirter anyway. But what did you think was going to happen? But the whole DeSantis's whole campaign has been like that, just terminally online trying to appeal to the Elon Bro set and they have just not thought about the regular Republican voters who would have been a natural home constituents for Ron DeSantis, where he could have built enough momentum to start looking like he had the qualities to be electable and could have brought some of these maybe Trumpers over. And instead, he's in a death spiral. He's firing staff, doesn't look like he can hold people. And, you know, just one bad process story after another. That's not that's not a way to keep not going. Yeah. Not to keep beating on Ron DeSantis, but one last question. And that is, it seems to me that his success in Florida and the reason he won by the margin that he did in 2018 was that he was seen as a good caretaker of the economy, as well as being really competent when it came to natural disasters. That's what people really want to see in their governor. What if he had leaned into that instead of the culture warrior, I got the sense that he wanted to use this upcoming term to kind of get some bona fides on some of the cultural issues. But had he just said, look, the reason I can win independence and the reason I can win in places like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin is I can do stuff. And I know how to run an economy and get things going. And you guys need the economy to come back. And I'm the one who can do it. It it doesn't quite sound like it. And I think this is where they've messed up. But there's a big messaging difference between Make America Florida and I've done a good job in Florida and I can do it in Pennsylvania Mm -hmm. because Pennsylvania doesn't want to be Florida. Right. Pennsylvania wants to be Pennsylvania. Right. What they want is for you to say look, here's how I did it. I kept things open during COVID when everybody else wanted to shut things down. And like, this was a weird thing. Like focusing on Fauci and Trump's relationship with Fauci is different from focusing on the fact that the whole world wanted us to do one thing. I did a different thing. And my success in the state is because they know I made my own judgment call. I trusted my gut. I knew what was right. We kept the economy opening. And let me tell you why this was great. And I will be a great steward of the economy and I will make your life prosperous. You person living in Pennsylvania. Right. It's different from being like, we're going to make you Florida because that doesn't resonate the same way. And I think he's just as a strategist. I hate it. I hate it like sort of morally. But like as a strategist, sure, you can throw in some of this red meat stuff and meet some of these voters where they are. But a lot of it was I'm going to be a competent executive. And even they call him Trump without the baggage. Tell them you'll be Trump without the baggage. Don't load yourself up with baggage. Right. Sarah, we could do this for another hour. But I could do this with we, you all day. We could do yeah. it all day, but we have these other things we have to do. Uh, which is such a bummer. Okay, let me ask you, this is our one fun question that we ask of everybody. Who was the first political figure that you met that had an impact on you? Ooh, is there somebody I met? Yeah. Does it have to be a positive impact? Because I'll tell it you. It can be anything. Happens. There can be people that you said, you know, for some people, it's this is why I got into politics. Other folks have had 
really funny interactions with their first politician. So it can be whatever you want. Yeah. So my first, uh, when I was took a job right out of school, I worked at this conservative think tank called the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. And my boss there was a woman named Christine O'Donnell. Christine O'Donnell, you may remember. Yes. We're both old enough to remember this. She was not a witch, but uh, she ran for, I didn't know this at the time. So she wasn't a politician when I met her. And she's actually not the politician in the story, but she got fired and went on to unseat moderate Republican Mike Castle in the Republican primary. She was an early Tea Party person and honestly, a canary in the coal mine for Trump and that whole movement. She lost to Chris Coons, the now senator of Delaware, because she was kind of a crazy person. And that led me to get her job. Well, so I got her job when she got fired at this place. And the first thing that I had to do is they were publishing Rick Santorum's book, It Takes a Family. And my job as the junior comms person was to like accompany him to his events, stand with the gay protesters and talk to the you know media and like carry books. Like I was just a Sherpa kid, but I was also like not quite out to my parents, but getting there. It was 2005. Gay marriage was the thing. Rick Santorum, everywhere he went, he was being asked about his comments equating homosexuality and bestiality. And it was a wild time to be walking around with Rick Santorum. And one day I was at an event with him and there was two women there with their like tween daughter. And she was holding up a sign toward the road. They were protesting and the kid's sign said, my two moms take me bowling. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to do this job anymore. And did you it's actually just walk off the job right there like, no. in the car? No, I, no, no, no. I think we all uh, have a dream that one day we just are going to walk off the job, right? Just like. No, no, I, I took it a little slower than that. But I, I made a couple of promises to myself in that moment. One was that I was going to quit, which I did. And the other one was that I was going to always be out. And it led me actually when I moved to D.C. to take just sort of a normal Republican comms firm job. I joined the log cabin Republicans and that sort of led me literally to the strategy I employ now. The one thing I really learned, I did a lot on Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I did a lot on gay marriage, really around talking to Republicans about those Mm -hmm. issues. I learned about the importance of margins, the idea that you do not have to convince everybody, but if you can convince 5%, 10% that you can win with that broad coalition. And that is how I think about politics right now in terms of defeating this version of the Republican Party. Wow. Sarah, that was a very good story. Oh. Very insightful. It's my, it's very my work. Just my political and origins. we are living in the era of very narrow margins. Yeah. Which is, we are talking two or three percent determining who the president of the United States is, who the next speaker of the House is, and who will be the next majority leader in the Senate. So very smart. Well, we'll chat soon. I'm sure we've got a lot more to so. do. Last question, focus group podcast. Yeah. So you have a lot on your plate. So this is not about putting pressure on you. Just sure. for your fans, i.e. me, when when do you think we can hear some pod? So we just taped, it's going to be out. We just taped a little nugget just to say we're coming back right after Labor Day. We will be back in September. I Look, I can't do a focus group podcast all summer being like, yeah, the voters are saying, I, I just I just told you in one podcast, I can tell you what everybody's been saying. And so I needed to give us some room to like get into the meat of this race or I'd be saying the same thing every week for 50 weeks. No, you, you are quite rare. All right, so everybody... Mark your calendar for post-Labor Day. Yeah, that'll be great. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Great fun. Always. Bye. Bye. I'm so glad you listened in on our conversation. Be sure to follow the audiers on your favorite podcast platform. Leave a review. And if you're a Cook Political Report subscriber, check out our exclusive bonus content at cookpolitical.com. See you next time on The Audiers. The Odd Years is brought to you by the Cook Political Report and is produced by Allie Flynn, Catherine Hamm, and Kate Wicker.